um, Paige Goulet. She's currently a neurology nurse navigator at Memorial Healthcare Institute for Neuroscience in Owasso with Dr. Riani Abu Rashad, who you heard from. Paige earned her bachelor's degree in health science at Grand Valley State University and continued her education at U of M for her bachelor's of nursing. She quickly realized that her education and work in various specialties, how important the mind, the body, and the spirit work together. We are so on the same wavelength. <laughs> Through her per patient, personal, and family experiences, she develop, developed a strong belief in how diet, exercise, and mindfulness and meditation can make a positive impact on providing complementary care, especially to the MS population. The MS community has made such a huge impact on her life her career, and she has pu it's pushed her to start the Doctorate of Nursing program so she can better serve patients in this specialty. She's very excited to see what the future has in store for these patients and how we can better help them. Now she's going to talk to you about diet and nutrition for MS. Thank you, Paige. <laughs> Thank you. All right, like she said, my name's Paige. Um, I'll be going through the diet and nutrition portion for um, MS. And I work with Dr. Rani, uh, Dr. Pace, and Dr. Cody at uh, Memorial Healthcare in Owasso, Michigan. Um, so if you wanna go to the next slide, we'll go from there. Um, so diet is a super complex topic, um, just as medications are in MS. I feel like diet, exercise, um, mindfulness, like Mindy, Mindy mentioned, um, is, extremely important in MS management. And it really can go, take hours to go over with each individual patient that's tailored to each patient, um, just like medications are. But hopefully um, I can give some clear cut points uh, to help better manage um, some of this and what we use in our clinic uh, and what I've learned through research um, in terms of diet and nutrition. So um, we'll start with where to start. You can go back to the last slide actually. Um, and four different things I just want to point out just when you're starting to think uh, either about changing a diet or even if you're just looking at um, diet and nutrition uh, for the first time or you've been newly diagnosed um, is one to keep your team in the loop. So always make sure you're informing uh, your MS team of any diets or protocols or food changes that you may be making. Um, just like you would if you were starting a, or stopping a medication, uh, it may have an impact on your MS condition. So it's important for you to share that um, with your neurologist, with um, if you work with a dietitian, obviously that's something that they're going to know about um, with your primary health care provider or any other specialist that you might see. So always keeping them in the loop is, is a big thing, um, whether it can cause positive or negative benefits to you and your MS. Um, we want to know that you've started something new. Um, the second thing is knowing your resources and knowing your sources. So before you start um, or implement any major dietary changes, it's important that you know your go-tos, um, knowing that they're credible. Because um, if you go on Google right now and search MS diets um, or food for MS, um, you're going to come up with a whole slew of um, results, then you want to make sure you can trust what you're reading um, and that it's going to make a difference or know kind of um, what's real and what's not. So you can go to um, your neurologist to ask questions. You can go to a healthcare professional you trust. Um, a dietitian, um, or make sure if you are reading things online that they're scientifically based um, or that they're evidence-based trials, because that's really how we gain um, our knowledge on this and how we gain things um, from medication and diet and exercise. So making sure it's, it's scientific based. Um, and third is to keep it simple. Um, so there are multiple complex diets out there, um, not just for MS, but for other conditions as well, but for MS too. Um, and they involve a lot of do's and don'ts. So if you're at least able to take one thing away from this um, and to keep one thing in mind, it's are you eating clean and are you eating fresh? So every time you eat something um, or every time you start a meal, um, is it clean and is it fresh? So if you're able to, um, and we'll elaborate on that a little bit more, but if you're able to answer that um, in terms of eating fruits, vegetables, lean meats, um, unprocessed foods, things with little additives, um, you may find yourself 
eating better already if you can ask that question right before instead of carrying around a list that has 12 foods that you are supposed to eat and 15 foods that you're not supposed to eat because it can get a little complex there. Um, and lastly, uh, if you can change your mindset from diet to lifestyle. Um, so when you're thinking of these changes, lifestyle is a way in which somebody lives um, based on values and beliefs. And it's just something more so a routine that you follow each day um, or something you follow throughout your life versus a diet where you're really restricting things um, and limiting specific foods to either achieve weight loss or things like that. Um, so really changing this to more so a lifestyle that you just live on a normal basis. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so the next thing is why does food matter? Um, with anything that we do in life, uh, you can think that what you put in is what you're going to get out. So um, that can go with work, that can go with relationships, that can go with food. And so when you think about what you're putting into your body, um, if you're putting in junk food, processed foods, uh, sugar, um, a lot of sweets, things like that, you can probably expect to not get the best outcome. Um, but if you're putting in fresh foods and um, clean foods, then you can sometimes expect more of a, a better outcome or what your body is going to put out. And just to take away from this that food as, as of right now really just aids in helping with the management of, of symptoms and um, of MS. It's not here to replace your disease modifying therapies for right now. So if you're on a disease modifying therapy, this presentation isn't meant to say, hey, let's follow a keto diet and have you stop your um, Mazent or stop your Ocrevus to do a Mediterranean diet. Um, it's more so to use as a complement to what you're already doing. Um, and some research trials have shown that a higher quality diet um, can have a, a higher quality of mental and physical quality of life um, and can help better manage symptoms associated with MS, such as fatigue, mood, um, or depression, bowel dysfunction, um, which we'll go through a little bit in the next slides. And we can go to the next one. I think there may have been one um, missing in between, but I'll kind of go through, there we go. Um, so what diet to choose? Just like when you go to your neurologist, um, whether you have just been diagnosed with MS or um, you've had it for a while and you've been on a certain medication um, and you go to your neurologist and they end up switching you, um, the way that they pick which medication uh, they put you on is typically research-based and has gone through trial after trial after trial to show that it's effective in um, what your end goal is. And the same should go for diet. And so we need to make sure that we're relying on um, good research and good levels or high levels of evidence um, for diet. And unfortunately, um, there's not one diet that cures all for MS or one diet that is perfect for every patient. Um, but there are some research trials that have been shown um, that some diets may be a bit more effective than others. Um, and that's why those ones at the bottom are in bold and we're, we'll elaborate on those ones a little bit more than the ones that aren't in bold. Um, but trials in diet um, and MS specifically are hard to conduct um, for multiple reasons. It's very, um, it's very expensive. Uh, to do research and to do research on diet specifically. Um, a good trial has randomization um, and it also has blinding. So you want your investigator, um, the person running the trial and the participant, so the subject or patient, um, to both be blinded. And with diet, we most likely know that's not possible. Um, so if you're getting a specific diet or not getting it, you're going to know and your, um, and your investigator most likely will know, but it's hard to double blind there. Um, and then also large sample sizes help um, with the higher levels of evidence. And that's a hard thing to do with diet trials. Um, 
people have a hard time adhering to diets and that can sometimes skew results. And also if patients aren't put in the category or the diet that they would prefer, um, that sometimes can cause some early dropouts or withdrawal from the trial. So there's a lot of different factors that can go into affecting the credibility of a research trial um, and its results. So that's why we haven't probably heard of one diet that's uh, administered or um, provided to every single MS patient. Um, so we can go on to the next slide and get more into them. Um, so the Swank diet is one that's probably been around the longest. Uh, it came out in the 1950s um, and initially started with a study tracking 150 patients with MS. Um, and over multiple years, for decades, probably until the early 2000s, they tracked these patients um, and they did find that there were um, less exacerbations of MS in uh, relapsing MS. Um, and also that there were um, less severe exacerbations. And so over decades of that, um, of following this low fat diet where these patients were limiting saturated fats, um, they did have good results in that uh, sense, but there were a lot of limitations to this study. And so that prompts physicians um, to maybe not use them as much because we don't know if those results are credible. So um, this is one that a lot of patients will still report that they've used um, with MS, but not necessarily uh, the biggest one, at least that our providers usually um, suggest just because of all the limitations on them with their research uh, study. So we can move on to the next one so we can get to the ones that we do have information on. And then the next one is the McDougal diet. And um, this one is a plant-based, uh, very low fat diet, um, vegan, which eliminates all meat um, and all animal-based fat. So uh, dairy products, um, fish, eggs. And while this, some of this or components of this diet are appealing um, that we'll get into at the end of this presentation. Um, there is little evidence that following uh, this diet strictly um, has had positive impact or um, research proven evidence on, on MS symptoms or MS management. Um, but I know they did have a, a recent trial that um, showed there was not a difference in relapse rates um, or lesions on MRI with this diet. They did have some improvement in fatigue, um, but they kind of related that more so to weight loss with the diet. And so, um, like I said, another one that isn't necessarily uh, recommended um, in our clinic either. Uh, there is a trial going on with this diet right now, so it will be interesting to see what that um, entails or what that shows later on. And we can go to the next slide. I lumped all these ones together. Um, so for gluten-free, Atkins, uh, low sodium diets and strictly high fat diets, um, a lot of the research that's been compiled hasn't shown um, any proven data on, on MS uh, management or improvement in MS management with these diets strictly. So a lot of the other diets that we will talk about, they include gluten-free. Um, so they will incorporate that in it, but also will have other things on it. So for people who are gluten intolerant or have celiac disease, obviously you're not going to consume gluten um, and that will fall into another category. But when they say gluten-free, just solely gluten-free, um, they don't have any proven data that that is going to um, improve MS symptoms or management of MS. And we can go on to the next one. And there are there is actually a couple trials going on right now looking at high and low sodium diets and modified Atkin di Atkins diets. So um, we will see what those show as well. So the keto diet, this is a huge diet that's come out uh, recently, not just in MS, but in a lot of different um, conditions, uh, but it's a high fat and low carbohydrate diet. And it uh, really focuses in showing the research has shown um, anti-inflammatory properties of this diet, as well as uh, neuroprotective properties of it. Um, and so there are good fats um, that we talk about. And on the next slide, we'll talk about um, 
food specific to this diet, um, but high good fats or amounts of good fats. So animal protein, plant protein, um, omega-3s that you'll find in fish and nuts and oils um, have shown improvement in fatigue in, in MS. And so there are current trials going on with this, this as well. Um, but there are some potential negative effects to be aware of with this diet also in that uh, weight loss, which can be a positive thing too, but if that's not something you're aiming towards or, or looking for, um, that could be a potential negative side effect. GI upset, um, an increase in your lipid uh, levels in your blood, and it's uh, also been shown to be harder to adhere to or stick to because of the strictness of the diet. So we can go on to the next slide and look at what foods uh, fall into this category. Um, so these are the main food groups that go into the uh, ketogenesis diet. And if you're going to follow this diet, um, at least with the meat and the seafood aspect of it, um, following the, the meat portion of it, and this is something, like I said, you should go over with your neurologist, potentially a dietitian, or somebody that, that can tailor this specifically to you. Um, but meat, the biggest thing with all these foods is making sure that they are high quality. So um, you can say, yes, I'm following a, a keto diet and I'm eating cheese for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, and it falls into the keto food group, um, but you're still not getting all of these other nutrients that you need. And so making sure you're eating high quality food and getting uh, food from all of these different um, examples that I'm giving here. Uh, so meat, if you're able to afford it, um, when you're able to access it, you're getting um, grass-fed uh, beef or meat versus um, grain-fed, um, looking and making sure that it's not genetically modified. Um, and then when we move on to seafood, looking at um, foods like salmon, um, if you're able to aim more towards that versus something like tilapia that we've read in research has higher mercury content or higher content of having metals that we don't necessarily want to suggest that either. So, um, and then eggs, cheese, nuts, butter, oils, um, low carb vegetables are, um, you're going to want to try to avoid high carb vegetables in terms of potatoes, um, beets uh, are something that are higher carbs, but have other potential benefits. Um, and then uh, corn will fall in the high carb uh, category for vegetables. And then um, this focuses a lot on small amounts of fruit because of the um, sugars that, that are entailed in there. So we'll go on to the next one. Uh, calorie restriction and intermittent fasting. This is a big one that one of our neurologists, uh, Dr. Pace, talks about and recommends and actually does on his own um, in the clinic. Uh, it can be complex, um, more at a cellular level is where a lot of the research is, has shown this. It makes, makes an impact on MS patients, um, but it's anti-inflammatory. It has some neuroprotective um, benefits from it and uh, research has shown increased health-related quality of life um, um, from the subjects and participants in those trials. Um, and there are different variations of intermittent fasting that we'll go over, but one of the biggest analogies I can give on this um, is if you are at work all day and you're working an eight hour day and your boss comes to you at the end of the day and asks you to stay an extra four hours. Um, so you stay, the next, stay an extra four hours and at the end of that shift, he comes to you again and asks for you to uh, stay another four hours. So now you've worked 16 hours and you haven't taken a break. You haven't gone home and taken a nap. Um, and then he asks you to stay through the night. And so you're working uh, almost a 24 hour shift without any rest, without going home and giving your mind and your cells a body or your cells and your body to uh, recuperate and um, reset essentially. Um, the same thing can go with our cells and our bodies. So we're constantly feeding them over and over and over again, um, making our body work over and over and over again for an extended period of time without giving them adequate time to rest and reset. Um, and so that's important in intermittent fasting, giving our body um, and the cells in our body time to relax, reset, and, and rest. And so this diet's not for everybody. If you have other um, comorbidities, if you have diabetes or other underlying conditions where 
fasting or restricting your calories isn't an option, then obviously, like I said, that's why you want to keep your healthcare team in the loop. Um, and just a little motto to live live by, but eating to live, not living to eat. So we want to eat in order to survive. We don't want to spend our days eating all day um, and living to eat. So just something little to think or remember. So the different uh, variations of intermittent fasting, the ones with the stars are the ones that our neurologists uh, recommend the most. Um, so time restricted, um, limiting food intake to a four to six hour window. So uh, you'll go um, during the day, you'll eat for a four to six hour um, time period and the rest of those hours you'll give your body a break. Um, and the five to two diet is fasting for two days per week. And the rest of those days, um, the five other days of the week, you uh, will eat normal. And so when you're starting out something like this, or you're talking to um, your neurologist or a dietitian about potentially trying something like this, um, you can start, a lot of people start at a 16 and eight, um, 16 hour and eight hour diet. Uh, fasting technique and that's where you'll uh, rest not eat for 16 hours and then you will eat for eight hours so you eat for from 11 to 7 and then you rest or don't eat from 7 to um, 11 the next day and when I say rest I mean not eating um, not necessarily resting yourself although that would be nice um, and then there's other uh, variations of this in uh, every other day fasting so every other day um, you will have something to eat the next day you won't have something to eat and then the other one is reduced calories so um this is just an example but reducing your calorie calories to 500 calories per day um for a uh, specific days of the week and then the other days just eating normal i'm gonna go to the next one so the Walls diet, that's a huge one. I know um, it's Terry Walls that a lot of uh, MS patients have um, read the book and uh, can it, it, adhere to this diet. And the, the Walls protocol is considered a modified paleo diet that follows um, a diet rich in uh, fruits, vegetables, uh, lean meats, and fish, which is in low intake, um, while avoiding other food groups that are mentioned on there. So avoiding dairy, eggs, gluten, um, highly processed foods, they get really down to the nitty gritty in, in avoiding nightshades, which are things like peppers and tomatoes, eggplants and, and white potatoes. And so there's a lot of specifics to this diet. Um, and the main one that came out, uh, there was a, a case report, which is a lower level of evidence um, as far as research goes that showed uh, regression of disability from uh, somebody that was wheelchair dependent, so in a wheelchair, um, to mild gait disability so that they were able to walk again. And this, but the study also involved a lot of other components. Um, so it looked at, uh, it included exercise, um, some stimulation techniques, supplements. And so there were other things that went into this. And this also was a, a case report. It wasn't a randomized controlled blinded study like i said earlier is really the highest level of evidence so um we don't necessarily at our clinic use this as a as a general rule for um suggesting this diet to everybody but there are a lot of a lot of benefits to this diet too because we uh, as um Dr. Boster said, avoiding highly processed foods, avoiding fast foods, fried foods um, is a big thing in MS as well. So um, this study, there's a couple other, I guess, research points on it. Um, there's been small groups of patients that have participated in, in these trials um, with this diet, and there are uh, trials going on right now with this. So like I said before, there's going to be a lot of emerging data that comes out hopefully with, with some of these diets, but um, improved fatigue and quality of life um, in some progressive MP, uh, MS patients with this diet, um, but it also was a, a small um, cohort that they used and they um, used a lot of different exercises, meditation and supplements that complemented, complemented it uh, together. So um, potential for improved cognitive function, mood, um, fatigue, quality of life, um, but there's a lot more data that needs to be shown on this. 
Um, and like I said, uh, there is a current trial going on with this diet as well as the Swank diet um, in comparing them together and really looking and honing in on fatigue. So that will be really interesting to see that um, the results from that one. We can move on to the next one. So the Mediterranean diet, um, I did the um, nutrition clinic for Alzheimer's as well. So I know that's not our focus today, but this is um, one of the biggest diets that we focus on with cognitive aging um, also. And there's a lot of neuroprotective factors that have research based behind this. And so it's, it's an interesting diet. Um, and I know there's some questions coming in too, which I can, I can either address at the end of this or um, I can answer questions uh, after the whole presentation is over too. Um, but the Mediterranean diet is low in saturated fats. It's, it's high in fruits and vegetables, um, low in processed foods. So we see that one consistently across um, a lot of diets. Um, and so that's one thing to definitely take away. Um, and we'll go over that one in, in subsequent slides. But um, it has been shown to uh, have reduced MS risks um, so for uh, at least developing MS, which I know doesn't apply to a lot of us here, um, and then also higher quality of life ratings than uh, control groups that were compared to this Mediterranean diet. So we'll go over example foods in, in the next slide, which we can go to. Um, so olive oils, um, fruits, vegetables, nuts. And when I focus on fruits, really berries are going to be the biggest thing. So they have a lot of antioxidants in them. Um, if you look at um, fruits that are very high in sugar, so bananas, dates, mangoes, and raisins, um, not to say you can never have them, but uh, when we suggest fruits, it's, it's more so leaning towards berries, um, strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, rat, um, the blueberries. Those are what we We'll focus on more with fruits. Um, and like I said, vegetables, nuts, whole grains, um, and then they go into moderate and low intake of specific foods. So um, this one doesn't completely eliminate anything necessarily. So it still recommends fish, uh, poultry, and wine is on here, which is kind of nice. Um, and then it has a low intake of dairy, red meat, and sweets. And so um, dairy, does have a, an inflammatory um, factor to it. So that's something that we don't necessarily uh, recommend having high amounts of. Um, and we'll get into sweets and whatnot on, on the next slides. And there is actually a current trial going on with the Mediterranean diet as well. So um, that will be interesting. It focuses a lot on specific types of olive oil. And so that will give us more of an insight on what we can recommend with that. But for right now, they really focus on extra virgin olive oil. Um, and if you're able to get organic, that's great. Um, but just really focusing on extra virgin olive oil versus something like vegetable oil um, or things like that that don't have as high of a level of um, antioxidants in them. So we can go to the next slide. So. I know those diets all have a lot of components to them and um, there's not one that I'm saying, hey, go home and get a book or two on a Mediterranean diet and stick to that and it's going to uh, prevent everything going on with your MS and it's going to improve everything. Um, but if we can take away some foods to avoid, um, I know they touched on this a little bit in previous um, presentations, but processed foods are a huge thing. Um, and I think one food that a lot of people don't uh, put into this category is lunch meat. Um, so that has a ton of sodium in it, um, a lot of additives and preservatives to it, um, and really any packaged foods that have those preservatives and additives in them um, are, are probably not things to put in our body. So really avoiding um, the processed foods is a big thing. Uh, large amounts of dairy, sweets, pop, and soda. Um, 
or pop or soda, whatever you would call it, um, depending on where you're from. But large amounts of dairy have a pro-inflammatory uh, component to it, is, and so does sugar. And you'll find that in, in research everywhere, not just in MS, but in other conditions as well. So um, I know it's easier said than done to avoid sweets, but if you're going to eat a sweet, try to look for something like a dark chocolate um, or or something along those lines instead of um, going and getting a package of Oreos. Um, and I think uh, Boster touched on this a little bit too, but if you look on the back of a, a package and there are um, a list of a bunch of foods or ingredients that you can't pronounce, um, don't buy it and, and don't eat it. And it's like I said, easier said than done. And you want to treat yourself once in a while too. But if you're really focused on um, sticking to a specific uh, food lifestyle, um, try to avoid foods that you, you can't pronounce. And then more than five won't help you thrive. And this is a hard thing to stick to too. But if you can look at the back of your um, ingredient list, and if there's more than five ingredients, if you can follow that rule um, to try to avoid foods that have more than five ingredients on the back of them, um, that just aids in, in other management of things like we talked about earlier. So we can go to the next one. So I have mentioned throughout this whole thing, when we get on each different uh, diet topic, is that there is a current trial going on with, with this diet or with um, this specific symptom. And so anybody that is interested in looking at either um, current diets that are, are enrolling um, for trials or ones that are going on but aren't currently enrolling participants in, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and if you... Um, put your um, search uh, terms in there that multiple sclerosis and diet, um, then you can see kind of what they have going on there. And we can kind of go to the next slide. Um, just a couple tips and tricks. So if you're able to go grocery shopping um, and stick to the perimeter of the, um, the grocery store, um, avoiding those center aisles is where you'll um, you'll avoid the processed foods, foods with additives and preservatives to them. So if you can try to um, go on the perimeter of the grocery store next time you're there, instead of going to the center where the chips and snacks are, that's a big thing. Um, if you're able to make homemade dressings and marinades, that can eliminate a lot of um, unneeded sugars or ingredients that are thrown in there that we don't necessarily know of. Um, and Dr. Boster touched on, on water, so I won't go too much into that. And um, if you are on a budget, there are a couple different resources I've added in there. And I know we're kind of running out of time. So um, that's something that I'm completely willing to go over with, with people after the presentation or at a separate time um, so we can touch on that. Because I know it's, it's sometimes expensive to shop healthy and to eat healthy. And we can go, I think, Mindy, did you want me to touch on the recipes specifically or? No, we'll... um, we can put those in the exhibit hall for people. Okay. And, then and I have a handout as well that we can upload there. Um, so it'll have the instructions on everything and give some um, direction on how to make those and um, kind of what they fall into. But there's just some different options in there. Paige, can you look at the questions in the chat? Yes, let me look. Sorry, I know there's a few that came I know. through. So, uh, to track. let me see. So they're not staying on. So I'll touch on, um, I know there's there's a lot here. So I would want to, I, I do want to answer them all. I don't know how much time everybody has, but, um, and if I can't specifically answer some of them here, I can always take them later too. But um, the thoughts on a vegetarian diet. So um, 
as far as I know, I keep saying this from a research standpoint, but that's really where we get our solid evidence of what we can and can't recommend. Um, but there isn't anything necessarily showing that um, that meat is bad. Um, I think it's more so the quality of the meat if you're going to eat it. Um, it does provide us with a lot of benefit too as far as protein. Um, but like I said earlier, the, the quality of the meat is probably more important than, um, or the quality of the fish is more important than completely eliminating it from our, from our diets, at least from what our, um, what our MS providers uh, instruct and what we have found through research and uh, research-based articles. Um, so that's the vegetarian one. Let's see. Um, as far as the dairy for MS, um, it, dairy, regardless of if it's MS or um, other conditions, it does have um, an inflammatory component to it. And that's been shown on a cellular level as well as um, other inflammatory um, diseases as well. So uh, I don't think necessarily um, having to uh, completely eliminate it from your diet, but um, being mindful that it is an inflammatory um, food. And so that's something that we can see in research. Um, and supplements, uh, along with any diet, um, I think the supplements would be something to address specifically either with your neurologist um, on, a, on a personal basis or with a dietitian on a personal basis, just because it's a very broad, um, a broad topic and um, not something that um, one size fits all or one thing fits all. So I, I would say that would be a, um, would be something to address specifically with your neurologist so it can be a um, more tailored to you specifically. I like the trivia question about the cats. <laughs> um, <laughs> Gotta add a little fun in there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, which diet do we use in our clinic? Um, the biggest, I would say the biggest thing that's recommended by all of our neurologists they're all very big on intermittent fasting, which I know, like I said, can't be applied to every patient because of other, um, maybe some other comorbidities or it's not for everybody. But I think with all three of our neurologists um, and what we recommend, um, the biggest one would probably be intermittent fasting um, and the Mediterranean diet. And that goes from um, MS to, like I said, Alzheimer's as well that we do the um, clinic with. Let's see. Are there any other ones? Let me see that I'm missing. Creatine, did you see that one? Oh, creatine. As far as, um, let's see. It says, is creatine okay? As far as like, a. Uh, supplement or a protein or in Not what con I would guess it would be a supplement. I would say a supplement. Um, so I would say with that one, like I said, with the supplements, I would, I would directly talk to your, to your neurologist or a dietitian specifically about those, just because the, the creatine I think would be something that would, would be addressed on a personal level, not a, like a, everybody all together. Um, and the intermittent fasting diet uh, is, why is the intermittent fasting diet recommended? Um, so this one, like I said, giving our cells, and it, it can get a lot more complex on a cellular level, but giving our cells a, a chance to reset, um, and it can show, it has shown anti-inflammatory um, components to it and neuroprotective factors to it. Um, so that's one of the biggest reasons our neurologists recommend the uh, intermittent fasting diet. It's had a lot of research shown behind it. 